Jonathan Fielding, and I'm here to give you my talk, Programmatically Performant, which is all about gathering data to, around web performance of your website. So uh, before we get started, I want to uh, say a bit about who I am. So um, I'm Jonathan Fielding. Uh, I'm Jonathan Fielding on Twitter because of the character length limit of a, of a user name on Twitter. Um, I'm a lead engineer at RVU, where I work on uh, the brand's U-Switch, Money UK, UK Bank Rates. I contribute a lot to open source, including the, the tech stack for this talk, all of which is open source. And I, I am the organizer of a um, bi-monthly meetup all, all run online called Programmed in Pencil, which you're, you're all welcome to, 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 to join. So to start with, what I want to say is many talk about performance focus on how you can improve the speed of your website. And that is very valuable. They jump straight to the, the steps that that are around making faster. I, and they don't teach you much about how to gather your own insights and your own data on your own users. And I, sh I, I should know, right? Because I've given plenty of th those talks about web performance, telling you all those tips and tricks. So today, I want to do something a bit different. I want to spend time focusing primarily on this data, both cl both collecting it and analyzing it, so that you are better equipped to solve your users' problems, while also having the business case to do so, because it's all well and good knowing your website is, is slow, but being able to tell your manager that your um, performance is slow and it's impacting the business in this way would help you justify spending some time on that. So let's look at the different kinds of data. So today we're going to be focusing on two kinds of data. Um, the first of which is synthetic data. So synthetic data, is, as the name suggests, is data captured in a lab-like setting. The purpose of this is it, it provides a consistent setting for your test to be captured. So usually what this means is that you have a web performance um, focused server running the test. In the cloud, um, the second type, and the second type of data we're looking at is real user metrics. Uh, this is often referred to as ROM data. Real user metrics are captured in the user browser, usually with JavaScript, and reported back to your servers uh, so that you can log them somewhere later for analyzing. And for both these kind of data, there are five key metrics we should be looking at. The first of which is time to first byte. So this is the time it takes from when your user's browser makes the request to to your server and for your your server to return that first byte. Um, from a user point of view, um, you don't you, you don't want them to be waiting as long, and this is the part you have the biggest control of because you have the power to change to, to affect how long it takes to render your page. The next thing is the first input delay. This is the time from the user interacting with your page in their browser to the time that the browser is first able to respond. We then have first constant for paint. Uh, this this is the time it takes the, from the um, user interacting your, with to load your page, and then they can finally see something on their screen. This goes back to um, the idea that the, the user will perceive your website is faster if they see see content sooner. The next one is largest content for paint. Very very similar to first content for paint. This is more focused on the main content being loaded, and will um, will help that perceived perception of your page. And finally, we have a cumulative layout shift. This is the measure of how much your your layout shifted unexpectedly. So sometimes you might have some CSS that loads too late, or you might have an image which um, doesn't have width and, and height attributes accurately set. And this can cause a, a janky layout jump where the user might be reading some content and suddenly the content jumps down and a load, an image loads in place. And that's a poor user experience and def definitely makes the user um, not really enjoy using your website. So this is a really, really useful metric to capture. So now we know what kind of data we can collect. Um, let's look at how we um, start collecting data synthetically. So we, for synthetic data, we need an environment that gives us the repeatable results. As, as I kind of already said, we, w we want to have a server where you can have a controlled environment. Um, quite often, you might run these in AWS, uh, Google Cloud platform, or maybe even DigitalOcean. Um, 
for, for, for today, what I'm actually going to do doing is running all my uh, browser tests in a, in a local Docker container. Uh, this this will just help speed up the, um, the time tests it takes to run because I'm not having to send a request to a server. Alongside uh, Browserless, we're also going to be using Lighthouse, which is developed by the Google Chrome team. Uh, Lighthouse is a website auditing tool which can give you information about the performance of your site, accessibility, uh, how well it com complies at being a progressive web app, along with other things. And it's a really useful tool to use um, to analyze your site anyway, uh, but today we're going to be using it for performance. So um, the way that we're going to use it is um, using the REST, the REST API from brow Browserless. Um, as you can see, we have this Docker container with this slash stats endpoint. We're going to call the, the, with the URL of my blog uh, because we're going to test the performance of my blog. Um, hopefully, it's quite fast. And then we can click Run. So th this right now is running that code against the Docker container. Um, what we'll see in a second is a huge JSON response coming back from the server with all Lighthouse results. So um, if we scroll back to the top of this, uh, it's quite a large response. You'll see that um, UA agent is Chrome. Um, we're using a version 5.6 of Lighthouse, uh, which is the current latest version. There, there, there will be a, a new version, version 6 soon, which does have some extra performance features, which um, unfortunately we can't use today. And then it has this whole set of audits. Everything from is on HTTPS, um, whether it redirects traffic to HTTPS, um, whether it uses a service worker, etc. Uh, today, we we're interested in things like the, the first Continental Paint. Um, we might also want to look at things like first Meaningful Paint. Um, and we and if we have um, if we scroll down a bit, we get we can find the um, max potential max potential first input delay. So like all the the, the data we've already mentioned, um, we 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 can find a lot of it in here. Um, so having got our lighthouse test results, we want to start pulling out those metrics um, because we, we don't want to store all that, all that data. We just want to store the metrics that we're interested in. So this is an updated version of the code, but this time we're, just, we're literally just pulling out the data. No, we are so no, we are pulling out the numeric values. Uh, these are in milliseconds. Cool. Uh, this this will be enough time. Cool. So we've got um, the first contentful paint, um, the time to first byte, and first input delay. Um, the time to first byte is reasonably quick, um, but the um, first contentful paint looks good to be about one point six eight seconds. So that's that's not not fantastic right now, and the user can't actually interact with my page at until one point eight seconds. So that that does indicate I have something to work with on my blog. To handle variance between tests, um, it's very important that we run multiple tests. And the reason for that is um, we, the, the, when, I, when we hit the website the first time, we might be hit, we might not, we might hit the CDN and it not cache the page, it's having to make a request to the page. Um, then the next request might be cached from the CDN. So like, it's good to get an average of those um, different um, scenarios. So if we call this, well, I've now wrapped this in run lighthouse method. Um, I've written the method here that what it does is it um, it'll take the, the the all the lighthouse results tests and a key. The key being maybe it's the um, first input delay or the uh, first content full paint key. Um, then we'll just reduce over it to um, get the add add those. Um, numeric values together and then we'll divide we're dividing by the result results dot length to uh, create an average of those tests um, we then ha have our um, three th three tests of my blog and then yes as, as mentioned we're using that get numeric value average to pull out an average of those three tests for each of these values now, if we run that, um, it's going to go and run three tests in the in the Docker image. This will take slightly longer than obviously when we did our, our individual test, uh, but it does do some parallelization, so it, it shouldn't take too much longer. Um, so when we get this back, we'll be we'll be looking at the averages. So yeah, these are these are these are the averages for those three tests. W with the data in hand, we now want to record it so that we can monitor the performance over time. 
because it's very good to see if our website is getting faster when we make changes or if our website performance has regressed. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use BigQuery. So this is a data warehousing product from Google. It allows us to, to, to store, store all this data in a table and then um, we're able to query it. There's lots of tools that will integrate with BigQuery to build graphs. So um, it's a really um, useful data store for this to kind of data. So um, all this code is the same as above, but it was um, just con contracted a bit. Um, but what the important part is, is we now added the BigQuery li node library. We then, um, instance, in getting a new instance of BigQuery, uh, creating our row. We're using, we're using a timestamp to uh, recognize when this test was run. And then we have, uh, we, wait, we wait BigQuery to install, in, insert that data. So if we run this now, um, it's going to run three tests, store it in BigQuery, and let us know when that's done. It's um, this, this, this data is data we're going to analyze in a minute, so um, it's worth us waiting for this to, to be done. Cool, that's done. So let's get on. To, let's 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 now look at analyzing that synthetic test data. How we stored our synthetic test data in BigQuery, we can now analyze it. So to start with, let's just get all the data from all the tests. So we have um, a simple query here um, where we can select star from performance experiments um, dot blog dot synthetic, which is where I'm storing it. We then create the create the query job using that query. And then we um, wait for the query to finish. So let's run this. So BigQuery is quite quick, and it's now given us all the results of all the synthetic tests we've run. As you can see, there is multiple tests and, and some days. So we want to, to to group these so we can see trends better over time. So um, what we can do is we can uh, truncate the uh, timestamps so that they are uh, rounded to the closest day. Uh, this this means that um, when we group by date, the um, we can actually start grouping by the same days. We then use at the average function in uh, BigQuery to pull out the averages for time to first byte, first content for paint, and first input delay. Then we can uh, run the query as we did before. So now when we look at this data, what we're going to see is uh, the time is, uh, is is rounded to the whole day, so it's at midnight, and it's, it's, there's one result per day. Having grouped the data, we will now be able to visualize the trends. Um, so it, if, we, if we look here, what I've done is um, if I, I've imported a library called Irvi. Irvi, Irvi is a, a, a node library for rendering uh, graphs on the command line, and as we have a graph a command line here, um, that's probably the perfect tool to use right now. Um, the main thing is we have to pass the data to, to actually uh, fit the formats we want. Um, so I'm going to uh, to take the date and truncate it to just being uh, the day and the month. Uh, we're going to round the uh, time to first byte. Um, the reason for that is it doesn't it won't display very well on the uh, on the command line otherwise. And we're going to render using a star because we're all stars, right? Cool. So what we can see here is um, the data. I, I didn't actually add a sort to my query, uh, which is why it's not in order. But what we can see is on the 15th of May, there was a spike in my um, time to first byte. And it, it it could be that um on that on on that date i i i had some kind of um back end problem maybe i had uh, a request going out to a, a third party that was delayed and being able to see that on that graph i can i i can start to investigate to see if i have a reliance on a third party that could potentially affect the performance of my website we can also uh, generate these graphs for other metrics so like first input delay and then if we, if we if we run that now we can see 
the difference on dates. Notice that um, on the um, on the fifteenth, we actually had a better first input delay, whereas it, on the twentieth, our first input delay was faster. So we, again, that might, that might be t be telling of something happening on the twentieth as well. So these visualizations allow us to understand the performance of our site day to day and will allow us to, to see whether the change we have made improve or negatively affect performance. So then that's really useful, right? So like if, if a change that you made has slowed down your website, you can revert it and, and try and make that change in a different way so it doesn't impact your users. Synthetic data like this will, will, will allow us to see trends in our website performance. And, but it will not tell us whether our, what our users are experiencing out in the wild. That's why we also need to be looking at real user metrics. So let's have a look at capturing real user metrics. Real user metrics are performance metrics captured in a in user browser, usually, usually using JavaScript. So very recently, um, the Chrome team have released a JavaScript library that makes this easy call, called Web Vitals. It's about 1K. Um, and it, and if you import it into your own JavaScript, um, you can just import it, import it with an import statement from from the node module, and then um, log it however you want. So I'm just using console log here, but you might have a logger that sends it to us to a server. Now, um, I, I now we don't I, I don't want to have to build it when working on some of these demos for you right now. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use something called unpackage. This allows me to um, load the load the library from a CDN. So this is what we're going to do here. So we've got um, we're actually loading two packages from the CDN. We're loading first input delay polyfill. Uh, this will allow this that to work on more browsers, and then we have our Web Vitals uh, CDN. So we we um, what I've, I've I've defined is a log uh, div. And then whenever any of these metrics come back, I'm logging the JSON object to the to the um, to this div. Once you figured out what data to capture from your users, you need to store it somewhere, and 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 that you can and, and that you can query that data and analyze it. So there are many tools that you can pipe this data into. Um, things like Google Analytics, where you can send an analytics event every time you get some of this data back and st and store it alongside your, your rest of your analytics data. Uh, Tag Manager is very similar. Um, segment um, and, and Meta Rotor, that they are tools that allow you to p send data into it and then pipe it to the data stores that you want to use. So today I'm going to capture the data into Segment. Um, this is because, again, like my synthetic data, I also want to pipe this into BigQuery for analysis later. Um, it means we can uh, do the same sort of anal analysis we did with the synthetic data. Alongside our um, alongside our uh, segment code, um, which I haven't displayed here, uh, we also need to start um, logging this data. So I've written uh, I wrote a log event um, just for, for debugging purposes. I've included a console.log, but the actual piece of useful code for segment was this analytic.track event that will send a track event through to segment. Um, whenever the, I'm trying to log something, I'm using the event name. I could have um, used the same name for all of them and then just provided a performance name here. Um, but it means that each one ha is actually sent to a different table, which, which in this case is can be, can be quite useful. And then I'm just logging the different metrics. Uh, Web Vitals does support all five metrics I mentioned. So um, as you can see here, we can verify that data is going into segments and see the five different types of data. So let's analyze the real, this, these real user metrics. Having collected the data and stored it in BigQuery, we can begin to analyze it. The first way I'm going to do this is uh, look at the median first contemplative of paint over the past seven days. The reason I normally look at medians first is that it's impacted by the outliers in the same way in averages. Uh, we use averages for for um, for the the other, the other tests earlier because um, our synthetic tests are not likely to have su have such major outliers. However, the I, I expect my my uh, real users test data to actually have some outliers. So to get the median, um, we're going to use this approx quartiles. Um, they're passing in the value. Um, we say the offset of being 
and a fifth data so exactly in the middle of our data um, and that's the medium um, and then we just run this query it's the exact same as I did earlier and what you'll see is is we got back all our, da all our dates um, and as we saw the median for um, the first content for paint here was 840 and that was the 19th so and we can do this for other metrics as well. So if, if we change the table to first input delay and, and run this, we, we will get some extra data back. The, 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 the date back this time being the median for first input delay. Having queried our data, we can then start to plot this data on a graph to see how the median changes over time. So this is our first contentful paint again. And uh, we, when we run, the, run this, um, we're using Irvi again. To, to visualize this data. Uh, we see, like we saw in our synthetic data, there's also a um, first contentful paint is higher on the 15th as well. Along with the median, to understand what's a, a bigger percentage of our user experience, we should also look at percentiles. So percentiles are, are important because they allow us to understand the curve of our performance metrics. So at the 50, 50th percentile, um, that represents um, fifty percent of our users are getting a, a website that's faster than that that number, um, and the same goes for seventy fifth percentile and ninety fifth percentile. So if we want to provide ninety five percent of our users a fast experience, we need to be looking at the ninety fifth percentile, for example. Um, we can add to our query to pull these extra data out. So um, we do an offset of seventy five and ninety five for the corresponding seventy fifth and ninety fifth percentile. Uh, and then we run this query. And then again, we can see the variance. So, and, and, and actually what we, what we can see here in this data is um, the median um, uh, 75th and 95th percentiles being worse on a day um, seem to correlate. Um, but let's not take that, um, just, uh, just looking at a few of them and, and seeing where it correlates, let's actually graph that. So um, for this example, what I'm going to do is we're actually going to um, have three graphs, uh, one, one for each percentile. So when, the, when we run this, uh, earlier we're in the three graphs here. So, and like I said, we've got very similar graphs for all three. This was just a small sample of things you can do with the data once you have it. And besides simply looking at the data in this way, you can also start to combine it with your other analytics data. So an example might be, um, say your website sells a car. Um, every, every every time someone buys a car, you might send an analytics event to your analytics provider. Um, if you've also sent performance data, um, what you'll be able to correlate is whether performance has the performance of the website correlates with you selling more cars. So in summary, by using a combination of synthetic data and real user metrics, we can start to understand the performance of our site. And understanding that performance is really important to us. The synthetic data will help you keep track of any changes in performance by using a controlled environment. So if you make a change that makes your website faster, you can see it very clearly. And, and, and it's also the opposite. And while and while the real user metrics will help, and, 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 and while using synthetic data is great, we we can use the real user metrics to keep track of what your users are experiencing as well. And by keeping track of both kinds of data, you'll have a full picture of your site's performance. Um, each each tells a different side of the story, and you and you and you will know when you need to take time to fix performance problems, because it will be evident in your data. So I want to thank my wife for being a guinea pig with this talk, along with my work colleagues. Um, and also um, all those lovely title screens had photos from Unsplash. Um, so I want to thank um, Marcus, City, Thomas, Aaron, and Chris from Unsplash for those lovely photos. Um, thank you for listening to my talk today. Um, RVU is hiring, so if you're looking for a new role um, in this difficult time, we are hiring at the moment for lead senior and um, software engineer levels. Th thanks again and have a nice day.
Thank you for that brilliant talk, Jonathan. And thank you as well for joining in with the Half Stack Band. Um, I can't wait until we can get together and have a proper rehearsal. Joe, that's a wardrobe um, change to match. That's amazing. Yeah. I feel left out, though. I'm in the wrong colour. What can I say? Vienna was a lovely event. It's all good. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. So I know from seeing that talk and seeing some of the other stuff you've done online that web performance is something of a passion for you, if that's really the right word. Does that bleed out into other areas of tech for you? So um, I, I'm impatient. So I, I hate it when websites load slowly. So um, there's a selfish side of it. I also have a slow internet connection at home. Um, I live in the I live in the countryside, so the best I can get is a 30 meg connection, which it sounds all right, but it's not really not when you when you've got so many things online. Um, so, like from a selfish point of view, I like, really like things to be fast. Um, also, like I like to consider like yes, 30 meg is bad to me, but there's people in other parts of the world which are on l less than a meg, right? Sometimes and those people need, need to be able to access this content, especially if it's like trying to learn about tech and to push themselves forward. Um, and without um, websites that are small and performant, they are, they're going to miss out on opportunities. So there's two sides of it, the selfish side and the opportunities being missed through the people side. Is there a, is there a business reason for... Um, thinking about the impacts of poor web performance, like why do we as developers need to care about this? Okay, so, so, so from a web perspective, um, we, the, the, there is a very strong correlation between um, w between w where people like conversion on websites, um, uh, like the number of things you have to sell versus, um, uh, v v v versus like your, your performance, right? And um, I think like Amazon did a study where it was like a 200 millisecond improvement in performance um, made them extra one percent revenue or something. So like that, that, and for Amazon that's huge, right? Like you're looking millions. So like performance can have a, a real big impact. Okay, so if, if the people watching this wanted to improve their sales by one percent and the uptake of their product by one percent, which area of web performance would you suggest that they start? Of looking at would it be JavaScript optimization, removing libraries, image optimization? Which area would you recommend they look at? So the first thing I actually recommend they do is open Lighthouse. Um, so it's, uh, that, that's available in the Chrome Dev Tools um, and run an audit. Um, that will give give you um, like a breakdown down of where your your the browser is wasting time. So um, and I, I, I because every website is different and where you prioritize your time is going to be different accordingly. Um, like the things like image optimization, CSS optimization tend to be the easier fixes. So if that's the ones that you could, that's are, are your biggest impact, then you're actually going to be off a good start. JavaScript optimizations, optimizations can be a lot bigger piece of work to do because you um, maybe you've used a giant library like the Apollo um, GraphQL library, and you want to switch to something like Urkel, which is a lot smaller. But um, that's going to that's going to be a huge rewrite of your application. Um, so like it's just, it's a lot more investment. So you you want to know where where to start first. And for those people who I mean I've heard a lot of developers use the excuse you know oh we can't be focusing on on improving performance we have to get the next feature out and the next new thing out. What are some quick wins that people can maybe slip in with that new feature to help their performance? So first I'd argue that performance is a feature of your product. Um, it's a non-functional requirement that might not be specified as part of your your uh, brief, but it's something that, um, a, as a user, right, you, they expect the website to be fast and snappy and easy to use, right? So um, I would be say I, I would I would be going to my my product owner and saying, look, this this is the feature you've you've given me to build. Um, as part of this, we have this tech debt and performance that we should be that we that we could work on fixing, and it's going to, and and trying to and and, and, and I try and understand like how long long you want to spend on that. So say we want to spend a few days on, on performance to, to help this. Um, adding new features to the website can obviously make the website slower because you're adding more code potentially. Um, so if 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 that's the case. 
um, you could you can make the argument that you want to reduce some of the that 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 code elsewhere to try and improve performance. I went to an event a couple of years ago where Facebook is like, "How do we make the web faster?" And we're like, "Well, what are you doing?" They're like, "Well, we're shipping seven megabytes of JavaScript that gets updated about seven times a day." I'm like, but you know, you build these tools like React and all the stuff with it. They're like, yeah, we don't have time to refactor fast enough to use the stuff we're creating efficiently. So we just, so what they instead did is they built connections to every ISP in the world so they would be faster. Like, so there's a, <laughs> there's a way to make yourself faster at scale. <laughs> the, pro the, pro the problem is though, it's not about just about what you send over the wire. It's also about like, <laughs> The CPU, right? Right, but like, that was their answer, uh, and it just made me yeah. laugh. You know, that was their solution. <laughs> but it's not a solution when it comes to like real right. devices. I mean, like, I'm lucky. I've got an iPhone. It's like got an incredible CPU, and it's got the fastest parse time for a mega JavaScript. But uh, uh, the average user is not is like on a mid range to the bottom range Android. Yeah, absolutely. So, what metric? do you think is missing? So if you, if you were going to bring in that next billion users, is something that we quite often hear, what metric would you like in your arsenal? To um, so I, I, I think um, one of the hardest things to capture is like an exit rate, like n knowing like how many people exit your website because it's slow. Okay. Um, because I mean, you could you could do that, calculate that as number of people hit your server uh, versus the number you manage to capture in your analytics. However, if people got ad blockers, your analytics might be blocked, so it's not really accurate value. So ha having some kind of exit rate of like these are the, this number of people exited my website before it loaded would help indicate there's a performance problem. And you mentioned. Um... Lighthouse, are there any other performance auditing tools for those of our listeners who are not using Chrome? So um, the, 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 the biggest tool I use is uh, WebPageTest. Uh, WebPageTest um, is a website, you can go to it, you, ent you enter your, 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 your URL, um, and it'll, allow you, it'll, it'll provide you a breakdown of the performance, including like um, a breakdown of how the assets loaded, it'll give you a score, um, you can choose to run the, the run it on uh, on mobile devices with um, restricted um, internet connection speeds. So you can start to understand like um, how your um, your website responds on those slower devices, how it responds under di different network conditions, and then and then start to understand like any problems that you're having. Yeah, I, 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 I can't say, um, like raise. Um, web page test highly enough really there's a question here um in the chat that says do you find any value in running lighthouse tests against each code change for example uh in github prs i think that's a great as a, that's a, a great thing to do if you can i mean it's quite it can be quite difficult to set up because you need a way of obviously doing that running that test in your ci system um However, if you're able to deploy your code to a server that's like a, a that's a like live environment, then I think it's very valuable to be able to see that. Um, if you can't if you can't run it on your pull request, um, do it as you deploy, so that you so like have a like a post deploy hook on your website that says when you when I've deployed, I'm going to run a lighthouse test, I'm going to capture the the git hash of that deploy so that i can see in a graph which releases cause problems that's what that's actually what we do at rvu we tend to capture the on the release uh we we want to do more around before that but it takes a bit more work yeah that sounds like a cool setup too yeah i think i'll be implementing that one yeah <laughs> nice tip um so thinking about um we're all locked down and stuck at home now, and a lot of us have home automation devices. I know one of your previous half stack talks was all around plug sockets and light bulbs and getting those to work more autonomously. Have you done any more work on that project? So um, I don't, for people who aren't in the UK, the UK recently had these had these heat waves every summer, like where you get really hot for at least for a few days, and it's not been very nice. Um, and it's already a bit hot today, yeah. And I can't have my fan on because the microphone. But anyway, um, what um, I decided to do this year, because I'm obviously at home a lot more, was buy an air conditioner. 
Um, but I just bought a cheap one off Amazon and it's got no way of integrating with other stuff. So I, saw, I bought a little um, like uh, infrared um, device called a um, SwitchBot, which basically allows me to connect my um, control the air conditioner using infrared, like it, like it's wood on its remote, but then then connect that to my phone. So I bought that not that long ago. So I've not had time to write much code around it yet, but that's my current project after getting this talk out of the way. Okay. I look forward to finding out more about that. Um, I'm doing some stuff with plugs and lights at the moment, and I'm fully going to steal your code from the previous talk. So <laughs> please upload that as well, just in case I need an air conditioner at some point. Nice. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jonathan. That was amazing, as always. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Bye.